So let's start with the first micro lesson. AI hallucinates. And to share with you a little bit about how AI hallucinates, I want to invite up my uh, guest instructor for today, Mark Stencil. He's the co-director of the Reporters Lab at Duke University. Mark and I have known each other for many, many years. Uh, we both worked together uh, in public media. I was at uh, WLRN, the Miami NPR station. Mark was the man a managing editor at National Public Radio. He has a long career, uh, DC-based, Congressional Quarterly, The Washington Post, and now he is working at Duke University, uh, bringing fact-checking, which is kind of a new discipline, a, a discipline that's coming into maturity and really taking it to the next level. He's going to share with you a little bit about how that's been happening, but he, his I interest in and in work in fact-checking dates back decades. Uh, he actually fact-checked uh, during four presidential elections. And uh, with that, Mark, welcome. And uh, wanted you to uh, get it get, get personal right away. Well, thanks, Dan. I, um, uh, many of you have probably been reading news stories about chat GBT, which is one of these language models that everyone is uh, chattering about. Uh, it seems like every news story in the world right now is how is generative text going to change the travel industry? How is generative text going to change fast food. Apparently, uh, this kind of AI is going to um, change the entire world. So that's that's good to know. We might as well start learning some stuff about it. Um, my own experience when, when chat GPT sort of became a big public thing of late, uh, I, I just went on, logged in, and uh, asked it to uh, tell me uh, what I was all about. And I, I asked it to give me a, a profile. And so uh, the results were interesting. Many of them were very good. And, and a lot of it seemed to be taken from my LinkedIn profile. But it also had a strange number of mistakes. It it said that I had been an advisory, an advisory member of uh, the International Center for Journalists, which is a lovely organization, but I, I've not actually been an advisor for them. Um, uh, it says that I, you know, don't hold a teaching position at the moment, which is probably going to surprise my students when I go to class in a couple of hours. Um, they, they may be alarmed to learn that. Um, uh, Dan mentioned that I was a managing editor uh, at NPR. Uh, ChatGPT thought that was uh, until 2012, uh, but it was actually until 2013. You know, small, you know, so close, but no cigar. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, it also uh, suggested that I had uh, played all these significant roles on the radio side of NPR that I actually, I, I, I love those people. I loved working with them, but that was not exactly what my focus was there. So it, um, uh, out of uh, a few paragraphs of biography, it managed to uh, bungle quite a few things. And that was uh, a little eye-opening for me. Th these are kind of, pernicious because they're very subtle like probably not a lot of people except maybe your your wife and maybe not even her would like even know these were inaccurate do you have any idea about where this stuff came up you came up with like uh for instance that fourth one could do you have any idea wh why they thought you might have done that work i you know it seems the thing about these language models is um they are not information generators, they're language generators. And so they scoop up all kinds of data, but then they remix it the way a DJ would. And um, and sometimes it's right and sometimes it wrong. it's wrong and it doesn't actually know the difference. It is not trying to intentionally uh, fool us or fool my, me or anybody else. That's not its job. It, it's not a truth telling tool. It's a model that takes uh, words and puts them together in a way that sounds coherent. And that's largely what it's mostly about. And, yeah. Uh, well, well, and we'll dig into more why it does it. You know, on that first one, you, you are on an advisory board with me for the Center of Collaborative Journalism. And uh, a peer institution is the International Center for Journalists. So um, that's why, Ch you know, ChatGPT does associations. And, 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 and so I think it just associated, well, if he's on the CCJ board, then the ICFJ is similar to the CCJ. So he must be on that board too. 
Um, but he's not. Uh, more curious to me is just the factual error of 2012 versus 2013. That just seems like a like a weird one. Like, you know, that date is in your LinkedIn profile. It's probably on your bios. Like, how did he get how, how did ChatGPT get that one? What, one of the one of the fun things for me with this whole conversation, which uh, you know, I I weirdly spent an hour typing messages back and forth with my new friend Chat GPT, and and I said like, you know, hey, this is not exactly right, and it would it was very uh, it was very personable and apologetic, and it was like, oh, I'm so sorry, and then it would generate a new bio, and then I'd say, well, how did you know that what I told you was correct? And and then it said, well, I checked this information, that information. I mean, it's 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 a very uh, you know, like I said, a, a friendly tool to work with. Um, but I can't. Even, when I asked it about how it did corrections, I'm not even sure I know that I can trust what it says about how it does its own corrections. And I don't quite know how. If somebody else went in here and said, no, stencil never worked at NPR, would it say? Oh, okay. I'll erase that information because clearly that was wrong. I, it's, it's a, there's a lot of black box to this that we don't really know how it's thinking. And I'll share with you. I peered in the black box a little bit in a few slides later, but um, you, you started a conversation with them. You know, your first slide was, "Can you tell me about Mark Stencil?" Uh, they started making these errors. So, uh, what happened next? Well, so this first one was was pretty spot on. It kind of just described what I had been been doing but then when it went on further if you go a step forward that's this is when it was started telling me about like oh I'm so sorry for the mistakes and you can you can get some of this language here for you know I apologize for this mistake in my previous response I mean it's a you know it really wants to do right by us right um uh, or it sounds like it does anyways um and uh yeah so it was it, it was it was a it it it's like talking to somebody who um you know maybe remembers vaguely meeting you at a previous party or something it has <laughs> just enough detail yeah exactly uh, so this is an example of hallucination and one way to approach it is just to put in another prompt correcting it it's apologetic it fixes the mistake so uh here's another approach uh, you'll notice this little thumbs up thumbs down that'll come into play here so I had my own run in. Um, a, a number of you are saying, hey, I asked ChatGPT to tell me what it knows about me and it doesn't know me. Um, and the reason why Mark and I it knows and maybe you guys it doesn't is because of our careers as journalists. I've published thousands of articles. And so there's a lot on the Internet about me. Um, if there isn't a lot of information about you, it may not know um, uh, that much about you. But the when when you combine that with like, the search engine, it might pull information off LinkedIn. The more information there is on the internet, the more likely generative AI will have something to say about you and the more likely it'll hallucinate about you. And it did that for me. It gave me a very concise, accurate description of my professional biography, except for one thing, which it said it served that, that I was the head of PR and communications for Open English. Now, I totally know how it made this mistake because my co-instructor in one of my courses was that guy. So it was like really easy for me to see how it made the mistake. So what did I do? I went and I put a thumbs down in ChatGPT on this. And then what popped up was uh, provide additional feedback. And it said, look, I wasn't uh, the head uh, of PR for Open English. This isn't true. And then I hit submit feedback. And I thought that would be where it ended. But there was actually one more round where they said, okay, we're going to now give you a new response. Is the new response better? And the new response el eliminated uh, the mention of uh, open English. So I clicked new answer is better. And then I moved on with my day. Now, the truth of the matter is the new answer excluded a whole ton of good information and one inaccurate piece of information. So was the new answer better? Not really. Uh, but it did exclude the piece of disinformation. I worry that AI has learned, okay, when it's asking, when someone's asking for you to tell them about them, let's keep it generic, right? Versus Dan wasn't, never worked for open AI, uh, for, for um, uh, gosh, uh, open English, sorry. Um, that That's my worry uh, is that, 
because generative AI is creating um, predictions of language, it's like autocorrect on steroids. It's um, it's not actually able to uh, systematically catch like specific errors it makes. Um, they're prediction engines. And what makes them generative or creative is also what leads them to lie. In other words, the, the same thing that makes them amazing makes them trouble troublesome. And we're going to really spend all day, like we've spent most of our master classes on what makes them awesome. Today, we're going to really focus on what makes them dangerous. And uh, computer science professor uh, Ellie Pavlik at Brown University said, what allows it to appear so intelligent is that it can make connections that aren't explicitly written down. But that ability to freely generalize, generalize also means that nothing tethers it to the notion that the facts that are true in the world are not the same as the facts that possibly could be true. In other words, AI is telling you what could be true, not what is true. And that is the theme for today.